Spiritism explores how concepts such as reincarnation, the immortal self, and free will shape our spiritual growth and ethical decisions. It encourages a deep connection with our higher, higher selves, fostering resilience, compassion, and a greater, greater sense of purpose in the face of life challenges and opportunities for personal evolution. That said, it is time now to start our first panel of the day, focusing on a new philosophy, reincarnation, immortal self, and free will. As the moderator of this panel, I would like to introduce Marcia Trajano. Marcia is the president and co-founder of the Solitude Center for Spiritual Living. She helped establish the Christian Spiritual Community of Atlanta, and she served on the board of the United States Spirits Federation. Professionally, Marcia works in the healthcare industry. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. It is so good to be here. I have to cheat. Two cheating mechanism. One of them is my friend, Josada. She's going to time my panelists today. <laughs> but anyways, I'm really interested to be here because we have four amazing individuals that are going to be part of this panel today. Thank you so very much. There we go. This is your honor, Umberto, since we're going back to medieval and uh, <laughs> early, early Christian times, right? But I, I just want to, I want to say that um, as, uh, oh, thank you, thank you. that we're here today to, to explore, right, this amazing topic of uh, spiritist philosophy and uh, those fundamental questions. We're here to discuss this new philosophy, the philosophy of reincarnation, the immortal being, and free will. So I'm really, really pleased to be able to be here and invite our panelists, so Yudi, Castro, could you please come here? And it's truly my honor to introduce Yuri, who is a licensed, I have to look at you, sorry, uh, <laughs> licensed clinical psychologist. Yuri is specialized in the treatment of severe and persistent mental illnesses in adolescents and adults. Good friend, yes. He has been residing in Florida since 2013. He's married, has two sons, and Yudi has been involved with spiritism since early, early age and started giving lectures in 2012. He is a volunteer of the Conscious Living Spiritist Group in North Miami. Thank you, Yudi. <laughs> I'd like to call Andrea Marshall Neto. Another good friend. And Andrea is the director at the Conscious Living Spiritist Group. She is the secretary of the board of the Spiritist Federation of Florida. She is the managing director of Liao Publisher uh, an affiliated branch of Liao Livraria in Brazil in the translation and dissemination of Divaldo Franco's Spiritus books. And she is also uh, the managing director for FEB Publisher, an affiliated branch of the Brazilian Spiritus Federation Publisher in the dissemination of Spiritus title. Andrea, 
Thank you for all that you do. And my third one to come here, Joan Corngoad, please. And um, Joan Corngoad is one of the founders and directors of the Spiritus Group of New York and the Spiritus Alliance for Books. He began studying Spiritism more than 30 years ago and has been one of the directors of the Mediumship Meeting at SGNY for the past 20 years. He's also responsible for study groups that focus on the basic books of Spiritism and on the Andre Luiz collection. He gives talks on Spiritism in Portuguese and in English, and João Gordgoat is an engineer and works as a banker. Welcome, all of you. Thank you, thank you. So, we're going to start with Yuri coming to talk a little bit about this whole topic here. Yeah. I'm Peter, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. You know, Peter, I don't have your bio, so, but I have a cheat sheet here, so that, that's okay. We, 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 we got you. Peter, how could I... Ai, my goodness, my, he'll, he'll never let me forget this. <laughs> Peter, Peter, please come to stage. <laughs> Peter, from the Spiritist Group, I'm so embarrassed. Love and Light in New Jersey. Peter currently is the Outreach Director of the United States Spiritist Federation. He's an active participant in the Tri-State Spiritist Federation and has published several children's books. He's here with his wife and uh, please take a moment to, to also purchase his books. They're amazing. Um, Betty Rosen who's here with him and uh, they're doing uh, they write their books and they publish uh, through their company, Saint Fronteiras Press, and with other publishers in Brazil, Colombia, and the U.S. Oh, what an honor to be here with you. So, we'll go ahead again. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you. Thank you all for you being here. How are we going to do this? I'm going to welcome uh, Yuri to give a little bit of his views on the, the broader topic, and once he's done, I'll invite each one of the panelists to give their thought on the topic, and then we're open for your questions. So this is the opportunity that you have to ask, send your questions here, all right? So Yuri, please, let's go ahead and get started. We have two, we have 10 minutes. All Good right. morning. <laughs> You guys are still asleep. Good morning. <laughs> yes. Being that this is the first panel and I'm the first one speaking, I wanted to start with a question that I want each one of you guys to think to yourselves. Why are we here? Specifically, why are we in this conference about spiritism, about life through the lens of immortality? What has drawn us to spiritism? And that applies to those who have perhaps been in this trajectory with this doctrine for decades or those who are just starting. Because in these conferences, we have people from all walks of life, all different types of understanding, and something has drawn you guys to be here today. Something has drawn you guys to consider spiritism and to consider the knowledge that it presents. And I want to offer answer a possible answer perhaps because each one of you is going to have a specific answer as to why spiritism some may say because of this philosophical aspect of the doctrine others may say because of the the religious or the ethical moral set of beliefs or spiritual spirituality aspect of it and some may say it's because of the science these irrefutable proofs that we learn through spiritism about concepts such as immortality of the soul reincarnation, free will, and so forth and so on. Some may say it's a combination of all. We each have our own answers, but I want to offer one. 
I want to say that we are drawn to spiritism in this, this set of knowledge because deep down in our conscience, which is we learn as is where the laws of God are written, we yearn for something more. We yearn for something different, for something better. Deep down, no matter our walks of life, no matter our trajectories, we, we yearn for that. We yearn for the thirst for knowledge and the hunger for the love and the teachings of Jesus. And that is the common thread, as I like to think, that draws us to all together here in this feasting, in this banquet of light in the form of words, in the form of energy, so we can improve ourselves and improve others along with us. But spiritism, as Umberto talked so well, it, it didn't, a lot of his con its concepts started a while back. And given the philosophical underpinning of today's conference, philosophy of spiritism, I wanted to bring attention to two giants of the field of philosophy that we find in the gospel according to spiritism in the introduction. Socrates and Plato. So Kardec is going to tell us that, again, spiritism and the vestiges that we have for the concepts can be found can be found all the way back, as Umberto so well presented before. But long before spiritism in the middle of the 1800s became something, Plato, Socrates, they were talking about man as being an incarnate soul. And we find this in the introduction of the gospel according to spiritism. Man being an incarnate soul, being, of, being this essence that is incarnated that assumes this material form temporarily but it's something much greater than that something much greater they even go on to say how when men look or contemplates that's the word they use its divine essence he directs himself to that which is pure immortal and eternal look at that pure immortal and eternal, which are still concepts that we're trying to grasp, that we're trying to understand, but already tells us that these, this type of knowledge has been being passed on generations through generations. And this is what connects us to God, pure, immortal, and eternal, because we are all created simple and ignorant as spirits, but we are of this essence of God, of this essence of love. And again, with the philosophical aspect of this conference, it's important for us to have these things in mind. And spiritism is, to is touted as this consoler promised by Jesus Christ. The consoler. But what does it console? It comes to help alleviate pains that we have endured for far too long for far too, and far too often throughout our multiple reincarnations, throughout this, this trajectory of the immortal soul. It is also said to be the third revelation, spiritism, the third revelation. But what does it reveal? Because for it to be a revelation, it has to reveal something that is there. What is that something? That something is the essence that has been with us in our collective minds for so long and we have been basically recycling some of its ideas in a way that we can now understand the new era that kardec talks about the new era of spiritism and of this knowledge is nothing but a new understanding of concepts that have been talked to us and taught to us for millennia for, long, for a long time so the idea of the third revelation yeah. let's switch with andrea if you don't mind thank you andrea let's try this one oh yes much better <laughs> so the idea the idea of the, of, the, of it being 
I think it's you, Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to speak loud. <laughs> so the idea, I'm gonna continue talking. Can you guys all hear me? Get real, yes, all right. get real close to your mouth, if you don't mind. Right here. Yes. Okay, let's try this way. All right. So the idea. No. No. Yep. no. But the, the idea of it being this, this revelation and, and the idea of it shedding light into something that's there, this essence that's already there. And then. This, this works. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Can you hear me now? <laughs> This idea that something that is already there, something that is immortal, all this knowledge that has been passed on for so long. And Kardec says that it sheds light into the mysteries of the past, but also opens the door or the doors to the future, to an understanding that gives us clarity in our minds and bring peace, peace to our hearts our aching hearts, our hearts that yearn for something, like I said, something else, something more, something better and something different. And this notion of the doors, of opening these doors, is something that Kardec talks about in the Gospel according to Spiritism in the introduction again, when he talks about Spiritism bringing this, or bringing and being this indispensable key that's the terminology he uses. This indispensable key that will help us become enlightened so we can learn the knowledge once and for all or in a way that we can also apply it. Because it's about internalizing the knowledge and also externalizing that knowledge through our actions, through our modified behaviors. So, we, so it's not dead knowledge, D-E-A-D, -E dead knowledge. It's externalizing that. And the key, and again, Kardec talks about how no spirit claims to have all the truths, that the ones that communicated, because not everybody or not every spirit has reached a level of maturity to be able to know all the mysteries. And so are we. We are much, much like that. We have now received, over almost 200 years ago, this new compilation of knowledge, this new way of looking at things that is actually a way that we can now understand because for far too long the message of our sublime friend who graced us with his presence 2,000 years ago has been misunderstood. For far too long his teachings have led, people have wielded his teachings in a, in a wrong way and have done awful things. But now we have this new outlook on, 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 on the knowledge. And that, what it, that is what Kardec is telling us of having this understanding. If we bring the, the, the picture that Umberto showed about the, the, with the mountains, we can even think of an analogy with that, that the further we climb that mountain, the more we can see further ahead. Whereas if we're down at the base, still beginning that climb, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have the capacity to look and be able to seek through. So the idea of spiritism then, with the immortality of the soul, of the reincarnation, this process that through which we progress and we advance, because that is the purpose of reincarnation, and the free will, which is the instrument that we have acquired, we have inherited through our, our progress, that we use to be the authors of our own destiny and our own work. And with that, I'm going to pass the word to my friends to talk more about those three aspects. Thank you very much. Andrea, would you mind coming here? We, until we resolve the microphone, everybody's going to be here. You stay here with me. You know? Good morning, everyone. Please allow me first and foremost, before I dive into the aspect of immortality, to dedicate my effort here um, to a young man named Gustavo, who discarnated at a very young age, but because of this was able to lead his family into a very special path of discovery, 
of immortality in light of spiritism. I would also personally like to dedicate a bit of what I may know to a wonderful writer, an author, that many people do not know yet, may have heard by name, but not have opened the pages, and others may already have come to know, Soeli Calde Schubert, whose grandson is Umberto and is here with us today. But Leon Denis decided to dedicate his work after death, stating the very following, dedicating to the great noble spirits who revealed to me the majestic mystery of destiny, the law of progress and immortality, whose teachings consolidated in me the sentiment of justice, of love, wisdom and devotion to duty, whose voices dissipated my doubts and eased my concerns. To the kind souls who have upheld me in my struggles, consoled me in my trials, and lifted my mind to the luminous heights where truth resides, I dedicate these pages. It's interesting to see the word of the great poet Leon Denis and in thinking about what I could say in 10 minutes, I started wondering if I could do a huge round table and ask each one of you what immortality means to you, how has immortality come to play, the knowledge of immortality in light of spiritism come to play in your own life? We'd hear diverse stories, comments, thoughts, opinions, but in the end we would all come to the conclusion that having knowledge about the immortality of the soul entails, first and foremost, the idea of divinity. God created us simple and unaware in order to progress through the many comings and goings, reincarnation. Because of our immortality, giving us this idea that is very empowering in a way, because although we understand that we are immortals, reincarnation is presented to us, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, but it's presented to us and we make the most of it. We make the most of it. And then many will say the consoling aspect. You might even start remembering how you may have become in contact from a very deep sentimental way onto the notion of immortality. When, for example, at the age of five and a half, I met my grandfather, who was Scottish, by the way, Irish, Scottish. And I remember that I did not speak English. And I was so afraid because I, I had just been adopted and I had these adults in my life and you know, it, it's scary for a child, you know, new people that you have to call mom and dad. But he traveled to Brazil because he lived in um, New York at that time, before he went to Florida. And I looked at him, he had the bluest eyes, and he looked at me. I'm not allowed to cry, but I, I do. Because I remember the moment I felt at home, I felt connected. And so immortality also shows us that through the lives that we are in touch with, this connectedness that in reality starts with our Father who created us all, destined to the very same place, achieving it, the progress, achieving it through our immortality. Alain Kardec has an amazing long comment on question 149 of the Spirit's book, in which he starts addressing the fact that human beings, instinctively, we hold the notion, the idea, the knowledge, the conviction that things do not end when our physical body perishes. And like Umberto 
talked about in his talk, the ideas might be diverse in many ways regarding the things that spiritism brings us about spirituality. But Alain Kardec is going to say, in vain, they may rebel against the idea that there is nothing when we die. Because very often, when the time is approaching of death, one may wonder, what is going to happen to me? Heck, if we wonder that, and we are spiritists, and we have the notion of immortality, imagine those that don't really even believe in anything. And so, Emmanuel, in the book, yep, I forgot the book. <laughs> yeah, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the spirit author who wrote through Chico Xavier, he wrote the following, he said, Remember immortality, our divine inheritance. That's our divine inheritance. Often when we talk to people in the fraternal assistance at the Spiritus Center, one of the things that we try to do is give them this faith, this hope, this clarity that we are children of God. That there is nothing greater than simply being those who will inherit the earth. Those who will inherit the universe, if we want to speak that way. He's our father. But then he says, the immortality is our divine inheritance. And here he reminds us, wherever you go, conduct your soul as a precious source of comprehension and service. Wherever you are, be generous, be optimistic, be diligent in doing the good. The flesh is only your clothing. And not only that, Alain Kardec is going to remind us that life in the physical body is that but a stepping stone towards our ever-ascending journey, towards perfection, towards the, the life of the one that we so admire that presented himself as being our master, guide and role model as the benefactors answer Kardec as far as thinking about Jesus. That's our destiny. Which is why he said, you can do all that I can and much more. And at that time, we couldn't really grasp the idea of what he was talking about. How can I do so much like the master does and so much more now? Well, rationally, one can't. We can't. But if we look for the future, and we see the many comings and goings, the many experiences in the flesh, whether Bostonians <laughs> or Floridians or Brazilians or Canadians or wherever it may be, white, black, Christian, Muslim, it doesn't matter. It is going to be through those many comings and goings that we will exercise all the potentialities of the soul finding itself yet in seedlings, but able to, through the waters of the tears, the sacrifices, the work of being able to pluck away that that doesn't work, that would kill a plant, whatever it may be, to eventually flourish into the beauty that we are all destined to. The end. <laughs> Really quick, because it's pretty. Struggle and become a better person. Accomplish work with Christ, but wait confidently for the future with the certainty that life awaits you today and it will always be fair and just tomorrow. Immortality of the soul. Thank you. <laughs> Jean, would you mind coming here? Jean will continue this discussion talking about Reincarnation. Reincarnation. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Nice to be here amongst friends once again, like we've been doing every year. And I was, when um, Naur was presenting, introducing everything, and uh, the symposium, the third symposium here, right? The theme of the third symposium was reincarnation, right? And uh, 
15 years later, we come to 10 minutes of reincarnation only, <laughs> right? That uh, I am responsible uh, to deliver. And I, I wanted to approach reincarnation from a philosophical point of view. And um, when I was, was uh, studying a little bit, I looked, I went to our uh, new resource, which is called inter artificial intelligence, right? And I wanted to find the origin of the word reincarnation. Where did it first start? Because we know the concept of reincarnation ex has existed forever, right? Since uh, we were incarnated here for the first time on Earth, all the civilizations have some notion of coming back to life, of being reborn, of having a new existence, but without the word reincarnation. And I found through artificial intelligence, Umberto, that the term reincarnation was coined by Allan Kardec. And then you brought that it was not. So uh, I'll leave to you. But without doubt, Kardec was the one that popularized the term. Before Kardec, reincarnation was not used in general uh, widespread terms. Uh, reincarnation comes from the Latin, uh, come back to, to the flesh, right? And so it makes sense that it originated in France, in French and not in English. But again, uh, open for discussion. The same is the word medium, right? That a lot of people say that it was first coined by Kardec and Umberto said it was coined by Post, right? And uh, I believe you. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, Kardec was the one that uh, really uh, popularized the word. Now, from a philosophical point of view, right? First, um, do you know how many Americans believe in reincarnation? According, according to the latest uh, research the, the, the done, poll done in 2018 by the, um, I forgot the name of the institute, one very famous one, 33% of Americans believe in reincarnation. 33%, that's one third of the Americans. Now, of the 33%, 32.9 have no idea how it works. <laughs> they just believe in reincarnation. So, we spiritists, we have the how. We have the understanding. We know how it works. So. We shouldn't say we believe in reincarnation. We should say we know that reincarnation exists, right? Because for those that believe, you can believe today and you can stop believing tomorrow. Do any of you are going to stop believing in reincarnation at any point in the future? Unlikely, right? Because we learn so much about it. Now, then we go to talk to friends out there and we start talking about reincarnation, how can we talk from it for a, uh, a philosophical point of view? I think the best way is to approach in the sense that Kardec did in, the, in question 222 of the Spirit's book. It's a long dissertation by Kardec, eight pages, and it really brings us the full uh, idea of how to approach reincarnation in a philosophical sense. Thinking, look at the differences between us all. How can we be living here in our first existence? Or, this is our only existence. So if it's our only existence, what happened before? We didn't exist? If we existed, it didn't exist? Why so many differences, right? I like math. Umberto likes literature, is a writer. Why he's a writer and I, I'm not? I can't write, I can barely translate. <laughs> so, you know, why the differences? Reincarnation gives us the answer. Dr. Ian Stevenson proved to us that reincarnation exists. He published books that he did his research and he proved that reincarnation existed. We spiritists have the duty to take it a step further, to explain 
how the process works and why. So why were you, we are here? Why we have to go through this existence that sometimes is so difficult, so hard, and why some people seem to have all luck in the world, some people seem to have all bad luck in the world. It's much more logical and reasonable, and again, spiritism is reason and logic to explain through reincarnation than to try to find other explanations that in the end, they don't make any sense. So when we talk about reincarnation, and if you want to talk about reincarnation with someone, bring this aspect. Try, ask them to prove why not. How? How can you explain, right? And then the best answer that people will come with is, oh, it's chance. So everything happens by chance. And if they come with these explanations, it's very hard to argue against, because if you believe everything happens by chance, the universe happened by chance, then fine. But if you want to go deeper and you want to analyze the concept of reincarnation and what it means and how it works and why it, it, it exists, then spiritism has all the tools and has all the answers and can help us. So there are several wonderful books. I, when we talk about reincarnation, I always go back to Missionaries of the Light. It's the third book of the collection of Life in the Spiritual World by Andrea Luiz and Chico Xavier. Uh, the best description of reincarnation from the point of view of the spirits from the spiritual world, especially chapter 13, when we learn about the reincarnation of Sigismund. And I highly recommend everyone to, uh, to read, reread, and study if you want to go deeper into reincarnation. But I think that's enough for us. Thank you very much. And uh, let's continue with Peter. Peter. I did not forget you this time, <laughs> come on board. Peter will talk about free will. Whoever, Thank you. <laughs> whoever I am, right? <laughs> whatever this guy is. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. you see, I thought maybe I was gonna get to escape this and I could just speak out. <laughs> didn't work. Oh well. In describing how he created sculpture, Michelangelo, the great artist of the high Renaissance, said this about his masterpiece, the statue of David. He said, I created a vision of Michelangelo in my mind and simply carved away everything that wasn't David. He makes it sound so bloody simple. <laughs> but Michelangelo was using his free will. Free will is when we make a choice or a decision. And free will is also when we make choices based on one or more options. The fact that we, well, if we take how Michelangelo describes how he creates sculpture and use that as an analogy for free will, it could be something like this. The act of chipping away can be our free will at work through intention, through effort. And within that, we're making revelations, we're making all kinds of discoveries, we're learning, and much, much more. And everything that we chip away, the marble, can be those challenges, those emotional mountains that Jesus talks about. The fact that we can do any of this to begin with is a gift from God. Why? Question 843 of the Spirit's book reminds us that we are not machines. Free will is essential to our existence. So as we are in a process of sculpting and creating ourselves through a combination of emotional and physical efforts, it is who we are. It is the self with the big capital S. Leon Denis in his book, The Problem of Life and Destiny, 
says this about free will, quote, humans are the architects of their liberation. Well, presumably, as architects, we need vision, but architecture is also a blueprint. It's not a fully realized result. And Leon Denis also goes on to say that in order to really achieve deeper freedom, we need to have enlightenment, education, that certainly requires effort and intent. And he also points out that we overcome our challenges by overcoming the inertia, our inner sloth, if you will, that we all have within each and every one of us. So, and then also Leon Denis ends with a very optimistic statement. He says that all material difficulties can be overcome. And in her book, Plenitude, Joanna de Angelis emphasizes as well that there's effort that is necessary to overcome our challenges. She says, beyond, she says, no one lives effortlessly Beyond the limits of automatic phenomena, life requires the use of the will and the focusing of our energies. Now, by automatic phenomena, she's talking about biological processes that don't have consciousness. We are certainly that. But we also, of course, do have consciousness, intent, and we also have um, the ability to focus our energies. And as we focus our energies, our choices become this complex mix of the conscious, the unconscious, the rational, the irrational, the mundane, the profound. And our free will is often operating within limitations of one kind or another. If we're going through major periods of expiation, how much free will do we really have? And there are times when our choices can lead to profound and significant changes as to who we are. Other choices, not so much. But it's those small choices that do play a role. So, as we think about how we conceive ourselves through, again, a combination of conscious and unconscious efforts, do we really have any idea what we are and what we're doing? Well, free will is a major engine of our existence, but at the same time, how much awareness do we have of what we're doing? Not all artists function like Michelangelo, who was able to see the finished result before he even began to carve. The great 20th century artist Pablo Picasso did not see a finished painting before he began to paint. In fact, he kind of rebelled against that idea. When Picasso was asked, where do your ideas come from? Picasso said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> he said, ideas are starting points. He also said, to know what you're going to draw, you have to begin drawing. So was Picasso using his free will? Absolutely, every step of the way, but he was doing it unconsciously. He thrived by being in the moment. And that's one of the great joys of creativity in art. But not just art, life in general. How often are we using both the conscious and the unconscious as we move through our lives? So, One could say that we do need intention in order to operate our free will. But sometimes we need to be unaware of what we're doing. Okay, but what about morality? Do we need consciousness and intent to develop our morality? Well, Leon Denis in his book, The Problem of Life and Destiny, stresses 
that free will is essential to morality. Why? Responsibility. As we learn, we use our responsibility more and more, we take on more and more responsibility for the things that we do and the things that we don't do. So as we increase our responsibility, which develops our morality, then we could say that our choices should and must become more conscious and more deliberate as time goes on. Morality brings us closer to God, according to the earlier part of the Spirit's book, question 11, by the way. So if that's true, are we really being guided in how we use our free will? Are we being nudged along? Do we really have a choice in the grand scheme of things? Sure, for a while. But according to the law of progress from the Spirit's book, the answer is not really, no. And how much time do we have to develop our free will properly? I don't know if anyone can really answer that question. But since life through the lens of immortality is the theme of this symposium, I'm gonna wrap up by trying to add this to the theme. Without immortality, our free will is rather limited. In fact, I'll go further by saying that without an immortal soul, having free will is almost meaningless. Why have such a complex, intricate gift of free will if we are barely given a chance to use it? By the way, in chipping away and carving everything that was not the statue of David, Michelangelo was not playing God. Although if you ever get to go to Florence and see the statue of David in person, it can feel rather lifelike, almost beyond words. But Michelangelo was humble about his place before God. He said, only God creates. The rest of us just copy. Thank you. Our timekeeper is stealing time, I swear to you. But anyways, I would like to invite Yuri Castro to come back and give us a little bit about how it all ties together. Would you come here? Or do you want to sit there? I don't, don't, let's, let's try the microphone. Yes. Testing, testing. It's, I don't know if it's on. It's on. Testing. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Podium it is. Thank you very much for my colleagues who presented such insightful knowledge into immortality, reincarnation, and free will. I've been given the, the complex task of summarizing these three concepts and how they interlock and interweave. So the idea then with the life through the lens of immortality, as Andrea spoke so well about immortality, if we think of the word lens, when we look at life through the lens of immortality, through the eyes of spiritism and the knowledge that it brought to us, what it does, it, it widens our understanding. It widens our view. So these lens act almost like the fisheye type of lens that we have nowadays with GoPro and other devices that we can widen our view. Because if we look with the myopic view of the materialistic eye, immortality, reincarnation, makes no sense. If we think that everything, there was nothing before, there's nothing after this, everything becomes a sea of sorrow. Everything becomes pointless and unfair. But when we see life through the lens of immortality, it's like we're widening our view and we see that there's something before, that we have something now and there's gonna be something after all, all of this passes. And then, how do we progress? As João talked about, bringing the Spiritus book 
through the process of reincarnation. And the word itself gives us the key to that. Incarnation, the act of coming into a body, into a body, a material body made of flesh. But the re in the word is the interesting piece. Because if we think of the re, it's almost as doing it again. But in the same way that we, when we have to redo something, let's say in school or, or at work, that we did wrong perhaps, when we redo, we do it better. We have to do it differently. So the reincarnation then serves this purpose as its own name already tells us of fixing past mistakes through expiations, which is nothing but the restoration of balance that was once lost, as Joanna de Angelis says in the book Plenitude. Restoring a balance that was lost and we expiate to restore that balance. Or, as also question 132 of the Spirit's book, when they ask about the aim of reincarnation, the trials that we embrace in order to progress, in order to shape ourselves, in order to do what Peter was talking about with the statue, where we ourselves, being this brute marble, through the reincarnation, through the free will, we can start chipping away at those pieces that do not belong to our pure, the plenitude of our spirits. And we can start to chip all of that weight, all of that impurity, all of those, those sediments that do not belong there. They're not gonna belong there when we reach that state of plenitude. And we can start to chip those away through the process of the reincarnation, trials and expiations, and very importantly, through the use of our free will. As Peter said so eloquently, this instrument that we all possess that we can make a difference in the present because we cannot change the past. And there's a lot about the future we can't really control. But we can definitely control the present. We can definitely control our own actions, our own actions, and how we move from now on. So with all of that, let us continue to open our minds to the knowledge that's going to be presented by the other speakers. And let us all continue to open our hearts to the sentiment of love behind those words. Thank you very much. Did we receive any questions from the audience? Well, I have a few minutes, so I have a few questions to ask, shall we? So I wanted to, to um, Andrea, she has the microphone, let's see if she, it works. But um, Andrea gave a beautiful um, clarification about uh, immortality. So can you provide maybe examples of uh, Jesus teachings in which immortality is directly linked to the very sought kingdom of heaven. No, come on in. <laughs> it's a very fluid kind yeah, of word. <laughs> when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, automatically we see Christ in a way instilling the idea of immortality in the hearts of those who were there with years to hear. It is interesting because a lot of times when we see him healing, when we see the dialogues, for example, when he would go and say, go and sin no more, in which he wasn't talking about the time the present time that had brought on an illness, much, 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 much later on would we understand the aspect of the law of cause and effect and how everything that we do does cause an impression our peri spirit, our peri spirit. In joking with a, a youth, a teenager at our center, I said, you know, just to make it you know, easy to understand, if I, who here remembers carbon paper, right? <laughs> That's what I said. See, some people went like that, right? But the, the teenager's like, 
carbon paper. She had no idea. But basically, in, in talking about that, only 2,000 years later would we come to understand that everything that we do does cause an imprint in our Paris spirit and would have somewhat of an uh, occurrence in a future life. Instilling the idea of the kingdom of heaven also gave us the notion of immortality because the kingdom of God is within you, right? Not really understanding how is it that possible? How is it? What is it? And of course, he's talking about all of the qualities, all that we are base, able to build through virtues and the acquiring of, of new virtues through successive reincarnation. And then later on, if we look at the way that he would talk to Nicodemus about being born again, he was talking about the aspect of immortality, although Nicodemus didn't really understand. Well, if you don't understand about this thing, how am I supposed to talk to you about other things that would further explain what I'm talking about, being born again? And so a lot of what we see in Christ's time was directly speaking to the immortal soul, was directly addressing the immortal soul. Some had an understanding of it, came to understand others like us, perhaps we were there, we did not. And this is why the Spiritist philosophy, body of knowledge, is known as the third revelation, for it reviews things that Christ talked about in dealing with the immortality of the soul that we could not understand, and today it makes it very easy to do so. Hopefully I answered that. Yes. <laughs> Whoever you are, those are great questions. Oh my goodness. And we have three minutes. So I thought those three meant another one. So I propose no lunch for anybody. And we stay here. No, just kidding. But I thought that this one, I would love to have Yuri address this specifically. Yuri. The question here is, we understand that any religious practice helps to improve our mental health by giving us resilience. How do you interpret religion principles in the treatment of people with long-term mental health problems? Can you give some examples in three minutes? Mm. Thank you for the question. So mental health more now more than ever, and I know it's my field, but I, I have to say that it's been the forefront of a lot of the talk, a lot of you know, the awareness surrounding mental health. And it's not for nothing. Nowadays, the materialistic grasp is still very strong, and more and more we're seeing a disconnect between, between that which is eternal and that which is material. And we're seeing a lot of these disorders, mental health disorders, as we diagnose them through the DSM-5 TR. We see a lot of that in our daily lives. Religion, as whoever asked this great question, indeed helps us build resilience, helps build connection and belonging. Because a lot of the times, these conditions and we can spend three hours here going through the DSM and looking at, of all the, about all these conditions. A lot of them has to do with a feeling of hopelessness, and especially if we're talking about major depressive disorders, suicidal components of that disorder. Hopelessness is the common thread between that and the suicidal ideation, intent, or plan. And the idea behind having religion aligned with mental health and just to make a parenthesis, Joanna DeAngelis brings us amazing insights into this, this bridge between psychology and religion. But the idea is for, this, for these religious practices or the religious belief to be intrinsic with the treatment of mental health because, again, if we look through the fisheye lens of immortality, reincarnation, and free will, we know that a lot that's, that happens in mental health, a lot of the struggles, the symptoms, are from either past lives or either from spiritual obsessors. There's way more than clinical psychology, a lot of the clinical psychology, I'm not gonna say all of it, still is very limited in its own view and its own practice. So there are, to answer the question, there are a lot of practices that involve, directly involve religiosity in the treatment of mental illness, particularly the severe and persistent mental illnesses. 
and they're all very important. For my personal work, I don't get to use, unfortunately, I don't get to use that very directly as I would like, but it's even then, even using it indirectly and taking the, the concepts and applying them in therapy and treatment of mental health conditions, we can see the results, the amazing results that this open and wide lens provide us. Thank you. <laughs> I mentioned that I cheated with the timer, five minutes. So thank you, Josada, for, for bringing this. Um, I also am gonna cheat. For all of those who have sent your questions, we have an Ask Me Anything panel that we can address them. So thank you, keep them coming. And uh, uh, thank you, all of those who are here through the web all my wonderful panel, including Peter. <laughs> Thank you so very much.